The Monerotopia guest segment is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. Can you hear me now? Yes, catch it now. Oop, hold on. I might have gone too far. Can you hear me? We good? Yeah, I hear you pretty well. Talk okay. to get on your awesome. end. Yep, yep, sounds great. Right. Yep, awesome. We're good. What's going on, man? How you doing? Thanks for jumping on. Uh, yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for having me. Busy, very busy times. Very incredibly busy times. Um, you know, all this political stuff, which is which is all bad. And uh, I, you know, I'm I'm more worried about kind of the acceleration of, and not only CBDCs, but the crackdown on on crypto and privacy coins in particular. So I'm just trying to get as many of these workshops going as possible and uh, get in front of as many people as possible, warn them about it and onboard them to uh, privacy coins and alternatives. And by the way, I, I've shifted since our last interview, I've, I've pretty much moved entirely into privacy coins at, because the landscape has changed because clearly what's happening is um, they're going to regulate and really clamp down on not only on privacy coins, but they're going to do more tracking. I mean, at this point, the IRS is going to require reporting self-custody crypto holdings. Coinbase is already working with uh, the IRS and they're using AI to track people's transactions. I mean, Bitcoin really isn't fungible anymore. And that is going to become incredibly problematic moving forward. Which uh, I'll continue with the question we were asking, Body. Which which administration do you think Monero will thrive under more? Uh, you know, a uh, Trump win or Kamala? And there's a bunch of different ways of looking at this, right? Um, but yeah, well, how, how do you think things would shake out with the Trump versus Kamala presidency? I, you know, so, so I think my my view on this is that you know, uh, it's been consistent. America 1.0 is over, and we need to start working on alternatives. And I and I've thought about this a lot, and it's it's. I think the best case scenario is Harris wins the presidency. The Republicans keep control or well, take control of the Senate and the Democrats have the House. The reason that I say that is if that happens, then the Republicans that are holding on to this idea that Trump can fix things, that will go away and people will actually start looking for alternatives. But by having gridlock in the Senate, it will prevent Harris from being able to completely crack down and go totally rogue. So to me, that's the best scenario. Now, what's actually going to happen? I don't know. I do think Harris is going to win. But I thought the Bitcoin Nashville conference was, I mean, it made me sick watching that. I mean, I'm just like, you're going to use theft through civil asset forfeiture, coins from people that we know. I mean, Ian Freeman's coins are part of that that Bitcoin strategic reserve, right? Um, it, uh, Ross Ulbricht's coins are part of it. So, so what's the what's the incentive system here? Now, if we get pulled over for a speeding ticket, are they going to confiscate our our crypto wallet? Right? I mean, civil asset forfeiture is horrible, and so that is the basis of the strategic reserve. And then the other thing is, people need. I, I'm I'm writing an article about this for Brownstone, where I'm going to go through the actual legislation itself. Cynthia Loomis is anti-privacy. She has had comments and quotes that are explicitly anti-privacy. She says she's only for coins that have an open and transparent ledger. And, you know, so her big, her Bitcoin reserve and buying a million Bitcoin, I, I find it to be like if Nancy Pelosi came up and said, hey, guys, um, I want to spend a trillion dollars worth of taxpayer money to buy my uh, my stock portfolio and hold it for 20 years. You know, how would people look at that? And that's essentially what what she's proposing with this Bitcoin right. strategic reserve. And I'm like, wow. I mean, it's it's the worst form of, of, of cronyism. But I think the worst development of all of this is, um, is the fact that now that Harris is running and they have this crypto for Harris thing, the worst scenario is they actually pass crypto legislation before the election. That's actually the nightmare scenario. Mm. Because you have to understand the basis for what they would pass, the starting point is the Loomis Gillibrand bill. And she's put this bill up now twice. She put it up last year and then she put it up again this year. So what, what does the bill say? Well, first of all, the bill bans algorithmic, algorithmic stable coins. It enhances KYC AML. It puts more reporting requirements on exchanges. And it essentially gives... Uh, stable coins to large financial institutions and puts regulatory barriers designed to kind of push out the likes of of tether and usdc and i i actually don't like 
I don't like stable coins at all, but 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 the idea that we're going to give monopoly control over stable coins, I mean, that's a backdoor CBDC. What people don't understand is that we really already have a CBDC. I mean, we have a digital currency. It's actually, it's in an Oracle database. The Federal Reserve runs on an Oracle database. It is digital. 92% of our money is digital. Whether it's the Federal Reserve issuing the digital currency to the banks or the banks tokenizing it on their end as stable coins, it's the same outcome. It's programmable digital money either way. So there is no solution where we don't end up with programmable digital money. Either the Democrats are going to do it directly through the Federal Reserve and the Republicans are going to do it through stable coins. So we have there is no choice uh, between these two two candidates. And there is no legislation that is pro self-custody, pro-freedom, or pro-privacy. That's not even being drafted, contemplated, or or discussed. So so to me that says more urgency on getting people out today and to start using privacy coins for day-to-day -day transactions today. That that should be an absolute imperative. And when you look at things like Kamala Harris saying, we're going to do price controls, well, boy, it'd be easy to do price controls if you had a programmable digital currency, right? I mean, if you look at some of her insane economic plans that we know don't work, um, they they certainly would be very well facilitated by programmable money. So again, the, the the message is always the same: get out and and stop using the fiat system in whatever digital form it's in. <clears throat> scary, scary times, man, but but exciting times. How are you getting um, good feedback at these events? Are people coming out? Are you meeting a lot of a lot of noobs? Are you converting people? I, I've been. I actually was sick for a couple of weeks, so I'm. I'm really ramping up. We've got a whole bunch of. We've got a, an event coming up. Um, I, I'm going to be in. Actually, it's in New Hampshire. It's Chris Martinson has his uh, peak prosperity events. We're going to have 225 people there that we're onboarding. Uh, we have an event in uh, New Jersey that we're expecting up to 300 people on October the 5th. Uh, we're rescheduling our, our Nashville event, which, which will be in, um, October or early November. So the demand is huge. I mean, we, we have, we're scheduling 15 of these events now, and now we have people in different countries. We have people in New Zealand, we have people in England, Canada that are now interested in, in having these workshops. So the demand is huge. Uh, as to the conversion, I mean, the good news is when people sit through these workshops, they're all converted. Everybody walks away with the crypto wallet. Um, but, uh, you know, thanks to your uh, in introduction on this, I've actually moved over to Cake Wallet. I actually think Cake oh, Wallet, because, you know, last time I was on, I was like, DEF CON 1, we need a wallet and a point of sale system. And, I, and I, as I said, I, I don't necessarily want to build these things if, if I don't have to. But I, talking to Vic, um, I, I think completely aligned. And and obviously, it's it's actually the best solution. And it's an easy solution to onboard people because within the wallet, you can use the relevant coins, right? You can use mm -hmm. the coins that Monero, you can use Bitcoin Cash. They're going to add uh, Zeno, which is which is awesome. That's a huge game changer as well. And then the fact that you can buy uh, gift cards and debit cards, you can do all that within the wallet. That is actually the best solution that, that I've seen. So I think that's going to really help with the adoption through these workshops. The next piece is the point of sale system. The point of sale system remains the... Uh, the real gating item. We have to have a good point of sale system to, to have an alternative when they try to roll out CBDCs in an emergency. And the update on that is, I think what we can do as a starting point is actually just fork AnyPay. So if you're familiar with the AnyPay point of sale system, if you know those guys, they had to kind of leave when some of the FBI bad stuff happened here in New Hampshire. So they've open sourced that. So I think that's a starting point and then we can build from there. So who knows, maybe maybe we can work with the cake guys on on that as oh. well. It is a good okay. starting point. And I've also talked to the Alpine people about tokenizing gold backs. I've, I've actually been working uh, with Zeno and really playing around with that. I've actually tokenized a gold back and I've sold a gold back. So through, yeah. <laughs> a, through a decentralized exchange with no third parties, just to show that what you can do. And I, what I said to the Alpine people is I said, listen, I can buy these gold backs and, and I can go to my barber and I can go to the local merchants and I can pay in gold backs and, and this is private. But if I go to your online system and I use your online system to, to do transactions, it's all KYC, it's all tracked, all of it's in a centralized database. So you need to have the same privacy protecting features for the digital form 
of gold backs and gold and silver as you have in the physical. And the way to do that, the way to bridge that, actually, I believe, is Zeno. Um, mm. and, and so there, so I may be going out to, to to Utah to talk to them about that because I think that's a big part of the overall. Yeah, so no, nope, um, ben, Benjamin from Goldbacks was was working on something related to that. Are you, you're communicating with him? You've been talking I'm to him? Yeah, he, he left there and he has another idea as mm -hmm. well for, for, yes. for doing this even on a more decentralized basis. And I'm and I'm open to it as well. In fact, he's helping us work on a workshop. out. Oh, there. OK, so, so I'm, I'm all he's a great him. guy. Great guy. We're going to try to we'll try to get him down to Monerotopia as well. I think I think he might come down. I think we're going to oh. down. That's awesome. So, so I yeah. think things are, things are actually proceeding pretty well. And as you know, w once you see these workshops and you see how people interact with crypto, here's the thing. I, I know we can be, we can win. I know we can provide an alternative, but I, you know, actually it's, I almost want to have more people from the crypto community, just observe what these workshops are like and see mm -hmm. what it's like when you're in front of 200 or 300 people that are boomers that are non-technical and to show them what the onboarding experience is like for crypto. It will be eye-opening. And so the thing is, the people lot. people are not afraid of digital payments. People use digital payments all the time. There was this announcement this week that USDC now has touch to pay with Apple, right? With your iPhone. Well, we need that, right? We just need to build better products. And, and if we focus on the, the design and the UI and we can do this with point of sale and then we've got Cake Wallet, then when the time comes, we're going to be able to onboard people. But there is huge interest in this from people that have never used crypto before. That Our audience isn't the people already in crypto. It's the, I think last month, 0.4% of Americans use crypto to buy or sell something. So like 99% plus of the market is still available to us. Most oh, people yeah. have never used crypto and and they're open to it uh, from the standpoint of they appreciate COVID tyranny. They understand that bad things are coming next. They know surveillance is increasing. And if you're a small business, you know that every time we have one of these emergencies, the large WEF companies are rewarded at the expense of small business. So small businesses are yearning for a solution. We just have to make something that's actually easy to use and has enough buying power uh, that it, it'll be worth their while. So I'm, I'm pumped. I, I'm actually pumped about it and I'm glad I'm feeling better because uh, we've got a, a lot of work ahead of us. I'm excited about, Oh, by the way, I'm really excited about uh, Monerotopia. I've, I've done some interviews. I talked to crypto vigilante. I had, I've had a couple oh, of, of really interesting in-depth interviews with him. And one of the conclusions that we had, and, and I wanted to talk to you about this today is, Please. We need to work on marketing and selling privacy. And I mean, I mean this in a way where it's like it's privacy is obvious to us. Privacy is not actually inherently obvious to everyone. In fact, young people uh, like this Cato thing that shows that a third of Gen Z would be OK with the federal government putting surveillance cameras in people's homes to monitor for domestic violence. Right. And so we actually have a bit, there's a huge discrepancy here. And, I, and I'm going to write an article about it and do a whole series of interviews around this idea, kind of a, the, the philosophical basis, the moral basis, because we need to talk about that as, a, as an actual, just kind of a natural right. But then people need to be aware of the surveillance state and how bad this has gotten and then how and then how much worse it's going to be because we get pigeonholed the privacy coin space is always like oh this is dark web this is all about drugs and money laundering and terrorism right that's that's how it gets pitched mm -hmm. but I, i'm sitting here saying now it's like no th this we can reach out to health freedom groups food freedom groups people that that you know are getting shut down that are trying to sell raw milk or people that you know with everything that's going on kind of behind the scenes what, what they're doing to farmers these are our natural have you, have you have you seen xmr bazaar that's that's kind of where we're trying to go with that i don't know if yeah you've... yeah yeah i've seen yeah. xmr bazaar and uh, i'm and i love I, I love that concept but we but we can open up a whole new audience like th I, this can start to become mainstream because People need to understand what you think is black market today are the things that you're, you use on a regular basis tomorrow. That's Crazy. absolutely the direction this is heading. So so like if we could do like a roundtable or something and, and really start working on countering this message of, you know, you're guilty before proven innocent and you must be doing bad things and because you're involved with privacy and actually just double down on the fact that privacy is a right and, and that everybody is going to want this where, where we're headed. Are you familiar with uh, Sal the Agorist? Yes. Uh, I believe he's coming down to Monerotopia. And, awesome. Uh, 
I want to maybe try to get you on a panel with him and one or two others. Uh, we could have it around this topic of how we actually take action to opt out. Yeah. Uh, shortwave surfer is tip 25 cents. Aaron is a real freedom fighter. Thank you for your work. Aaron, uh, Aaron, by the way, have you seen this tool that we, that we launched as well? This is, this is a exciting little, little app. XM, XMRchat.com. So it's a way to send super chats with Monero. There's no, no sign up as somebody sending a tip. It's, it's actually pretty cool. I, I haven't used it yet. I do. I remember getting a DM about it when it was in development. So yeah, that's awesome. That's very yeah, cool. Ch check it out. We'd love to get you using it. Super easy to, to, to create an account. Uh, a couple of clicks, you just put your Monero address in there and you as a streamer, you have an account like you could have xmrchat.com slash Aaron Day. And then anybody watching your stream can go to that URL and very easily send you a Monero tip without paying any fees to any third parties. That's awesome. That I Yeah, love yeah. It. <laughs> Uh, so when, when you're when you're talking to these people, these, these noobs, which I, I love that you're doing this, I, I do it as well, but I love that you're doing it in like an organized fashion and uh, making it so perhaps we can start to get it to scale. What are you telling people that that do take interest and they're like, okay, well, how do I how do I obtain some Monero? How do I get my hands on it? What, do you, what I'm just curious what kind of uh, advice you're giving people? Well, right, right now what we're doing is I'm, we're working with Vic, so it's going to be part of the it, that's part of the onboarding process. So people are actually okay. going to be given we're giving people Monero as part of the uh, part of the work. And then you're but like you're instructing them to use like instant exchanges and whatnot to like you know whatever they go buy Litecoin on on some centralized exchange, transfer it to Monero, or they use XMR Bazaar and start selling stuff for Monero. I'm just curious if you're talking because well, yeah, those, and, those and, are good and, lessons, right? To, and, for, and, for new. And, and even the features within the X, uh, the cake wallet, right? So you, you mm. can actually do some, do some transactions right within the, the cake wallet. I am looking for a, and by the way, this is, this is a struggle because I've, I mean, I've been out of, I haven't been using centralized exchanges for a long time. I've been out kind of out of the whole thing, living off of this stuff. And so as I've tried to help people that are like, oh yeah, I want to get more involved in this, it's so much more difficult to use centralized exchanges to do anything now. I mean, it's like the KYC process and everything else and how long it takes with the, with the bank account. Um, I, you know, I maybe Kraken, I, you know, I might actually try to see if there's a, a, a way to partner with them on this as well. I, I don't know if you have any recommendations because I Coinbase is not it. I will tell you that much. I, I absolutely will not recommend or touch that, but mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts? Because the, so they're kind of, these people are so new to it that actually just them having a wallet and then seeing what you can use. People don't realize that most people don't even think of crypto as a currency. They, it's actually not even a use case. Most people that I talk to only think of it as a speculative investment and most have a negative opinion of it. Mm -hmm. When I do these workshops, even the presentation of it, it's about sound money alternatives because I am showing gold and silver and crypto. But if I just made this about crypto, people wouldn't show up for the workshops. Now they get, they get their mind changes during the workshop, but the, the, the the kind of the bias already and what their expectation and and knowledge and thinking of crypto is is so negative that if if this were joint come to the crypto workshop nobody would show up yeah that, yeah that's how bad this is totally agree yeah the, the bridge is the bridge that you're using which is uh opt out and people are, are waking up to the need to opt out and then you're teaching them crypto as a tool they can use to to achieve that goal i, I totally agree with you that's that's the path forward with growing the tent. So, so what I've been doing is I've been, you know, so some people have Coinbase or whatever, I, I'm gonna, or, or Kraken, and there's always mm. a, so you're in the workshop and you give people crypto and you show them how to do it. And then, and then I'll get responses back for the people that are really want to go to the next level. Then I walk them through how to do an exchange account. And that becomes kind of a one-on-one -on -one back and forth time consuming thing. So there, I need to actually come up with a solution that I can embed into the into the presentation where we can kind of accelerate that. Mm -hmm. I've been recommending recently, by the way, it, it, there may be better alternatives. And if, if you, if you know what they are, let me know, but I, I've been re recommending Exelix to people. Oh yeah. So, yeah. Exelix is great. So buy whatever yeah. you're going to buy BCH or whatever. I don't even, I don't recommend stable coins, but buy, buy BCH, buy whatever you want to buy and then use Exelix to, uh, to swap it for a privacy coin. And so that's been, been something that i've been recommending yeah excelix actually they, they uh they just recently started sponsoring one of the segments we haven't uh started posting yet but we will next week so excellent is great they're good instant exchange 
Uh, we'll have them on the show too if people want to talk to them and get acquainted with them. Uh, but there's not a lot of trust involved with instant exchanges because you're never holding your money on the exchange. Um, yep. But I don't think they're known to do shotgun KYC. So there's no KYC. And I don't think they have a bad habit of doing shotgun KYC. Uh, and their fees are competitive. Uh, but obviously, Trocador is always a good one that kind of the community talks about um, because they they basically you know look at all the different instant exchanges and give you the best rate type of thing. And it all goes through Troc Trocador. And they're very good with no KYC and... Uh, you know, and, and that's and that's built in that, as I understand it, that's integrated into the cake wallet. Yes, um, yeah, exactly. So although exactly. I, although I, I it didn't have Zeno, which which is something that hopefully that that that'll that'll oh okay me. because I know yeah, Zeno, but... Zeno if I go to Trocador directly I can use Zeno but it wasn't at least one last time I tried in the in the cake wallet so hopefully hopefully something happens there. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I suspect well, Tux, you got something to say about that? That's that's a swap that we we could probably enable it even before Zato um, is available in Cake as a wallet itself because there there is um, there's a I think there's an open well a PR that needs to be finished um, for Zano and Cake Wallet um, it'll be there fairly soon um, probably in the, I'd, I'd suggest the next few months hopefully Zano will be in Cake Wallet uh, but even before then we might be able to enable the swaps uh, with Zano. Uh, within Cake Wallet, obviously Xana Wallet will just be outside of Cake. Um, that'd be helpful. That'd be, yeah. Someone to look into. Yeah, no, that that would be helpful. And and I'll tell you once once again, this is why I like Cake. The fact that Xana is going to be integrated. It's like so. My my talk is about. So CBDCs are all assets are going to be tokenized. Money only represents five percent of total assets. Everything else, stocks, bonds, your house, everything is going to be tokenized. And they're actually already building centralized versions of this. So the way I look at it is. Zeno is for tokenizing non-monetary assets, and then you know you use Monero and Zeno for uh, for actual privacy as a, as an actual privacy coin. And the fact that that's integrated into Cake Wallet, like that, that is the powerful combination to me. I'm I'm saying that that is the that's the answer to CBDCs and what's called the Great Taking, which is this uh, process where they've changed all the contracts. Where when there's a big financial collapse um, and there's a bankruptcy. You you're, you won't have ownership of your stocks or 401ks. It'll go to the largest banks or who are the secured creditors. So you don't own your stocks. You don't own your bonds. You don't own the money that's in your bank account. So we need to start privately tokenizing and trading our own assets and, and exiting the system that way. So the, it's a powerful mm -hmm. combination. And, and Cake, Cake Wallet is going to be like the, the go-to place for that. I'm, so I'm super excited. Yeah, it's a tremendous idea. Um, and yeah, if it could be done in, in a privacy-preserving way. That, that that is the breakthrough there. Uh, amazing, man! Amazing. Any any uh, any news, thoughts, info about Roger Ver? I know, I know you're you know you're in contact with him. Just curious if you have any uh, updates. Uh, so you know, I mean, I've gone through. I spent five and a half years in a really complex lawsuit, and so I I, I make a, a an effort to just not even talk about. It. Like, I don't want anything where there's discovery or anybody's brought mm. in. So I I don't even talk about it. I, so I have no. I have no inside information and I, I intentionally don't even talk to him about it. However, I will say I have a, I just have an intuitive, not great feeling and I, but there's no information to support it. And by the way, this is just so, that I, I, and it may be unrelated, but Roger, uh, the DOJ reopened their action against Kim.com within 24 hours of Roger being arrested. And then we just saw this extradition order signed um against kim.com i i don't know that there's anything related between roger and kim.com but i i just i i just i can't describe it but i have a sense of unease about it but there's no that's not information that's just you know i could be just wrong or overly paranoid um I, you know and the reason i'm heightened by i guess i have heightened paranoia about this is that after going to ian freeman's sentencing hearing um, and then, you know, Roger retweeted the, the invitation to that. And then seven months later he gets arrested. I, I guess I I'm on a heightened sense of awareness because we know the government is cracking down on crypto. Uh, it's government policy under executive order one, four, zero, six, seven. But, uh, with that said, that's no information on the flip side, on the positive side, since this is all speculation, the IRS settled, you know, billions of dollars of FTX liability, tax liability for pennies on the dollar. And Michael Saylor resolved his tax situation. So if we're looking at the recent precedent, then then Roger should be able to 
resolve this extortion situation, you know, fairly straightforward. If if he doesn't and they're actually pursuing this, then we really know that this is motivated by something other than just the standard extortion and, you know, getting their get, getting their cut of the money 10 years late. Right. Then then there is something deeper involved. And then that that would be alarming. But I, I'm hopeful that he he resolves the situation uh, amicably and quickly because because we need him back in the fight. What is potentially the deeper motive there? You think it's uh, it's an anti Bitcoin cash thing, anti crypto privacy thing, or anti using crypto for digital cash purposes thing? So I've I've thought about this. So when you like Carolyn Ellison, so Sam Bankman Fried's girlfriend uh, at FTX, her dad works at is is at MIT, and he works on like. Uh, marketing strategies for basically manipulating population and, and kind of whole behavioral analysis type of things. And in fact, he, and he worked on in particular, uh, how to optimize getting vaccine uptake. And I bring this up because I, I you think about this in terms of p pandemics, right? There's like, who's patient zero. Cause if you want to see the virality of something, you want to see, well, wh who are the real sources of a movement taking hold? And if you look at look at that and you know that they look at things this way then if you look at two of probably the largest players responsible for getting people involved in bitcoin are ian freeman and roger veer so i, I believe that they were silenced because uh, they are known to be effective probably some of the most effective people in the history of crypto at getting early adoption i mean this is just a fact Ian introduced Bitcoin to Roger and then Roger, you know, became Bitcoin Jesus and did all of the stuff that Roger did. So I, I, I believe, and I actually even said this in the book and I talked to Ian about it before, you know, he was, he was actually sentenced this, they need to shut down crypto, which they're doing with the exchanges and the reporting requirements and everything else, because if they're going to roll out CBDCs, they need to make sure that there's no competition. So I, I believe that Roger is in this situation and that the timing of his situation is completely related to the fact that it was just a few weeks after hijacking Bitcoin went out. Because if you look at the timing of this, I think the Bitcoin ETF hit in January and then three months later, this book hits. And then three weeks after that, he's arrested in Spain. So I don't think they want him talking about hijacking Bitcoin. I, I, that, that is my belief is that the timing on this is related to not wanting him to talk about hijacking Bitcoin, because right now people are being psyoped into thinking that Bitcoin is, you know, freedom money. And, and it's and it's not. It's ridiculous. You have people buying financial instruments where they're two levels removed from the Bitcoin. They never touch the Bitcoin. All of it's tracked. Um, and and yet it gives people the 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 delusion that um, this is going to be something that is going to be able to be used to fight CBDCs. And so Roger destroys that narrative in this book. I mean, the book is, I have been blocked by everybody. I've been blocked by Adam Back. I've been blocked by Samson Mao. I've been blocked by all of the core devs just for writing a brief thing saying, hey, I read this book. It's great. You should read it. Like, they, like that was essentially what the post was. So People do not like the content of this book. And I've, I, inter, I engage with Bitcoin Maxis often on my post and nobody has refuted any of the facts of this book. So this book is incredibly powerful, but now Roger can't talk about it. And so Roger can't talk, which is why I actually spent a lot of time, you might have noticed on social media during the Bitcoin Nashville thing, I actually took a lot of the content mm -hmm. of hijacking Bitcoin and tried to really push it through on social media because I'm sitting here saying this... The, the whole book that Roger talks about in, in hijacking Bitcoin, that the whole big block thing is about propaganda and censorship. And now here we are, they're having a conference where they're inviting presidential candidates and everything else. And I, I believe the censorship of, of, of Roger involves him being arrested in Spain and basically being in a position that he can't talk about it. It's next level censorship uh, in, in a way. So I wanted to try to get the, the information out. And by the way, people are reading this book I can't, I can't, I, I should show you, I should share if I can get permission, some of the DMs, people that were Bitcoin maxis have changed their mind. I've had, I've had messages from people that said, look, you know, this has, uh, you know, it's been jarring because once you know this, you, you can't go back. But I've had people that have said they're now alienated from their social circle because they were in a group of Bitcoin maxis. And now, 
um, they can't go back. And so, I mean, they were actually saying they're grateful that I'm putting this content out because now there are more people that, that they're able to meet. But this book had a big impact and it would have had a much bigger impact if Roger weren't in the position that he was in. Yeah, I mean, ironically, I think it ended up bringing a lot of attention to the book, right? Um, yeah, definitely. The word's been, word's been getting out. I actually haven't sat down to read it myself. I need to. I feel like I, I've, I, I know most, most of uh, what it's all about, but I, I need to, to give it a proper read. Well, I remember what was going on at the time. I wasn't as, yeah. I, I was more just using Bitcoin. I wasn't like directly involved in this stuff, but I knew generally what was going on. But when you read mm -hmm. it, it, it really, it, it's Lays jarring it because it's not like this book could have been Roger ranting about, you know, his experience. And it's not, it, the majority of the book is he's using public comments from the Bitcoin core devs and from the other side, he's using their own words and their own facts in the timeline. So when you read it, it's like, oh, like, yeah, I didn't realize some of the specifics around replaced by fee. And, and I, and I have a different way of describing what happened. I, I, you know, I view CBDCs and, and this whole ultimate thing is to create a, a global currency backed by energy credits where mm -hmm. the UN 2030 sustainable development goals are elements of a social credit system. And I, I won't unpack all that now, but I, there's, I think there's su sufficient evidence to this, but it's all about technocracy. It's about elites using manufactured scarcity to create their own closed economy that they just so happen to dominate and have control over, right? That's mm -hmm. what happened with Bitcoin. It's ca a cap and trade system. Luke Dash Jr. said, we're going to keep the block size small. And then Peter Todd came in and said, we're going to use this replace by fee auction system for how you can bid up your transactions within this false you know, uh, scarcity model. So I call it cap and trade and it's technocracy. What happened mm -hmm. to Bitcoin is very every bit is tech, a, a technocratic agenda is what is going on with CBDCs and the WEF. And um, so but once you see who funds these developers uh, and you actually start tracking because Roger's book goes from kind of inception up to 2017 and I've been following it from 2017 on and it's like you know, how many people tied to the CIA and the NSA and to nefarious characters do you want funding the developers of your open source project? I mean, Michael Saylor has been working with the CIA and the NSA through through his company. His office is like 10 minutes away from the Pentagon. I mean, this is a guy who's now saying officially in his own words that the point of, of Bitcoin uh, is to comply with KYC AML, to pay your taxes and not to compete with the euro, the dollar, MasterCard or Visa. This is these are his stated words. So we've got a guy who's worked with and been a consultant for, you know, deep state agencies out pushing that as the narrative. How did we get here? And, and, everybody's, other... and everybody's cheering for it. It's like the iron uh, right before everybody's eyes. It's amazing. That's crazy. Yeah. So, so, um, and, so and I, there's, there's yeah. so, there's so entrenched, those that are entrenched, I know you're, you're saying people are reading this book and they're, they're getting deprogrammed, but uh, <laughs> for the most part, those that are, you know, maxis are, are so entrenched. There's, there's, there's no hope of bringing them back. It feels like I don't know. Some have I, there again. I will tell you, there are a few that have changed. There are some. There are Bitcoin core developers that troll me every day, that are actual mm. active Bitcoin uh, core, and and I try to interact with it. And and you know, and part of it is. So th I, I read the book uh, Block Size Wars. I don't, that that's kind of the other side yeah. of this, I guess. Yeah. And and. I might write an article about it, but whether I read an article about it or not, I, I would say I don't think it's far off even what Roger says. Like I, I even I, my takeaway from that book is that it's not that big blockers are wrong. It's that their tactics sucked. That's what I take away from the the block size war book. Mm -hmm. And and in fact, when I read it, it reminds me. And, and by the way, this is something I think we need to talk about as a community because <clears throat> Roger talks about propaganda, censorship, DDoS attacks. All of that actually happened, right? But when you look at that, there's a parallel in politics with the Democrats and the Republicans, where the Democrats, people are like, well, Kamala Harris, she didn't even have a primary. There's no democracy here. But the Democrats win because they all fall in line. They remain unified. They use propaganda. They use the existing institutional form format. And, and it actually wins. And so even in the block size war thing, so on the block size war, there were a couple of different proposed block size things going on. And there was competition even within the block size thing. And the small blockers just remain unified. And then they use their censorship and propaganda. So 
as much as we don't like the, I, and I don't want to use their techniques I, because I don't want to become them, but, but we actually do have to acknowledge that, you know, those techniques work and, and why do they work and, and what can we do to, to disrupt that without actually violating our own values. That's, that's an issue that I, I don't have any resolution to, but I, I've really been thinking about it a lot. So. Rise to Liberty saying, just FYI, Monero fam, this New World Order, CBDC, Smart C, social credit score nonsense will be officially launched here in Utah. It will be previewed at the 2034 Olympics. I'll, I've got the docs and will gladly share. Uh, hey, please, uh, if, yeah, actually, if you would please reach out to me at Aaron R. Day, I would love to see that. I would absolutely love to see that. Yeah, Rise to Liberty, you're, you're welcome to jump on, obviously, as well. If Aaron hangs around, uh, you can jump on to the viewers on stage and talk directly to him as well. Uh, Prying Lantis tipped $1.69. This is literally a movie. Yeah, it is. It's a, a scary movie with like an obvious ending, which is technocracy. Um, for no, everybody, every, no, everybody using privacy coins, and we defeat the technocracy. That's the ending. <laughs> well, the, the current, the, the current plot. We're tr we're trying to change it, but uh, you know, the the current trajectory is is a losing one. Obviously, we're doing everything we can to change it, but um, yeah, obviously, I, I wouldn't be out here, man, if I wasn't a, an optimist like you are. Uh, I think it's possible. I think we ultimately, I think you know, math is on our side, right? That's the the power of encryption empowers people it's a technology that we've never had uh that <laughs> literally can democratize everything in the most positive sense decentralized power um that no central authority can control that's the power of encryption and all they can do is try to make it illegal um but we're at a time where everybody has access to it and it's open source and it's pretty much impossible to to stop so it's just a communication issue at this point and communicating to people the the need for people to use these tools and realize that they're doing ethically the correct thing and they're on the right side of history is is, is my short take on it well, so that's why I think if we can have like a marketing panel or I know have a lot of conversations at Monerotopia before then, too. But 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 really, I, I'm looking forward to to actually interacting with people there, because if we can yeah, you're start, if we can start putting out marketing messages like so take those 17 sustainable development goals that the U.N. has. Right. It's like they want to control you know, 15 minute cities or they want to control energy. They want to control the land, the air, the sea, all of these different different aspects. Well, those are natural allies. Groups that are opposed to those 17 sustainable development goals, those are our natural allies. Those are groups that mm -hmm. if we present this to them in a, in a friendly way and and sell, because you know, they understand why privacy is important, they don't want these things either. And they under, and once they understand that the control system for the behavior that they want to control is behavior that almost no one would want if they were aware of it. And so there are already groups that oppose these different individual items. And if they realize that the control system is money and that private money is the solution to stop this, then we can actually open this up to people that that would never have been, you know, normal people that we would think about in a you know, Monero community or, or Zeno. Um, and and they also haven't been the good news. The good news, by the way, about talking to <clears throat> these new people, these noobs, is they haven't been tainted by you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm already tribally aligned with one coin and one project, or they're they're not like they don't have all of the baggage. So so that's actually a really good thing is that we actually get people from a from a clean perspective. So if somebody new is like, hey, I'm at this event because you know, I lost my job because I refused to get a vaccine, Wh whatever the, the reason is that that got them there. And now like, I want to fight back, tell me what to do. And then their first experience with this is, oh, now I've got Cake Wallet and I've got Monero. That is their very first experience. We define exactly. what their experience is exactly. uh, without the baggage. Well, you know what? 99% of the market is out there like that. Mm -hmm. It's Greenfield. So as much as there's the fighting internally, and I, and I admit, I, I do some of it just because I saw the Bitcoin Nashville conference as something that really set us back six months because just you know like the idea that people think that politicians are going to facilitate crypto adoption it doesn't even make sense at any fundamental level it's so beyond how did we go from peer-to-peer -peer digital cash to well gee maybe i can get them to steal people's crypto and make it a strategic reserve and then you know financially rape and pillage my children and grandchildren to use taxpayer theft to buy more of it like who like that's just not part of the plan in any way, shape or form. And now, but the cult is like all rallied around that. So, 
So we do have to do we do have to differentiate to the extent that Bitcoin, the Bitcoin core maxi narrative dominates because it's what's on mainstream media. You know, it, you're going to see Michael Saylor on CNBC. You're not going to see Roger, unfortunately. You're going to see and whoever's advising Trump and, and RFK. I mean, first of all, RFK's. I wanted to ask you about RFK. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. RFK's running mate. Uh, who funded basically his campaign, her boyfriend works for a, a lightning network startup. Okay. So, so, so the advice that RFK is getting is, is completely warped and biased. And by the way, but completely counter to, so RFK is the, I'm the anti-corruption guy. Exactly. And, exactly. And, and now you've gone out and said a significant portion of your net worth is in Bitcoin. The person who funded your campaign has a, their livelihood, the boyfriend's livelihood is Lightning Network. And now you're talking about buying four. That's the croniest thing I've ever heard of. You have negated <laughs> all of your environmental stuff and, and your, your health freedom stuff by your actions immediately in front of us right now. So I was I, I was stunned by by that. Like, wow, you know. So. Yeah, especially especially the tie-in with um, you know chain analysis companies and the revol revolving door between regulators and those who you know previously worked the chain analysis companies and vice versa. Right. That's a, that's like an RFK Junior thing that he should be all over. Right. Like seeing yep. seeing the corruption there, and. Uh, for some reason, he hasn't picked up on that. So I don't know. Is is he is he a hypocrite? Is he just a dirty politician, or has he just been fooled? I don't know. I I don't I don't know for sure. But but if he's if he's been fooled, then he probably wouldn't be a very good president. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, like at mm -hmm. some point, I I would expect. I, actually, I don't have any expectation because I don't think that there's a political solution. But I but if if I did think that there was a political solution, I would want somebody that. Him being duped on crypto is kind of like Trump being duped by Fauci. Like it's it's kind of like that level, of right? Fauci. Exactly. Like I've, I've tried I tried talking to his administration about it when uh, we were at the Libertarian National Convention, and yeah, there there was a disconnect there. There was a disconnect, um, and I got him a copy of my book in there. And I know some people that are actually involved with this campaign, and I tried to get in, get some information to him, and and. Who, whoever he, he's got bad advisors that mm -hmm. very clearly has bad advisors, but more importantly, he doesn't seem to have an openness to expand the, the, the field. And so at the end of the day, it's just, you know, again, I, I think the irony of all of this is that he's basically going to hand the election to Harris because, it, because as I said, and as you know, the Democrats fall in line, including mm -hmm. Kennedy's own family members. So who is he taking yeah. votes from? He's taking votes from Trump supporters that are like, yeah, the fact that Trump's not even walking back Operation Warp Speed. I mean, even if you said, OK, well, the guy made a mistake, but he could learn from his mistake. He's doubling down on the mistake. So for a lot of people, if that's your issue, you're going to vote for Kennedy. And then on the crypto side, you could even see how it pans out. You even see Max Kaiser and all of these other people. It's like, oh, Trump, Trump only Trump and Loomis. That's only one million Bitcoin in the in the, in the strategic reserve. Kennedy's four million. So right. I, I see it online. So so so. So Kennedy is taking crypto and uh, health freedom votes from Trump and is going to hand it hand it to, to Harris. It's it's hilarious. I mean, it's not really hilarious, but it's it's so not what I think people were expecting the quote game theory to work out. So anyway, yeah, it's it's like a movie like that other commenter said and to see all these politicians just, uh, you know, doing this what's well, so predictably the political thing to do. Uh, in such a showy way i mean it's 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 terrifying to watch right it's terrifying to, to kind of predict these things and to see them happening i i know i know you're very good at that in a scary way um, loomis is, is an ayn rand villain cynthia lewis she truly is like a like a, an antagonist in, a, in an atlas shrugged or a fountainhead kind of kind of movie and and just the fact that she put laser eyes in her bio, I, I guess that gives her a pass, but everything that she's doing, all of her legislation. So, so when I write this next article, I, you know, I've got to balance how long it's going to be versus everything else. But, but all of the crypto legislation that has been written by Republicans gives more control to bankers and it has more reporting requirements and it it's bad for privacy. There isn't, there has not been a single good piece of legislation. And so people have this idea that somehow Republicans are better on this. And now we're going to have the worst case scenario where we're going to have Loomis Gillibrand as the starting point with now Chuck Schumer coming in, 
trying to get something passed, which means it's only going to get worse from there. So the worst case scenario is we get crypto legislation this year. None of the crypto legislation is good. The sooner we get the legislation, the worse it is because that actually shortens our window to doing this stuff. This is why I say we need to make the whole moral and come up, I don't know what all is, the, the big marketing case around privacy uh, to market to these groups that that I, I am so sick of this whole, def like, again, you, you, we, we know we see it. We're guilty by default. We, we are assumed guilty because we're engaged in privacy coins. That has to change as the mindset, like just head on. That's absurd from a moral perspective is, is this idea. I mean, and I see it on my thread all the time. I have people from BSV trolling me all the time, and, and it, which, which is weird in a whole other different way. But um, we need to make privacy a necessity. People need to understand the necessity of privacy. It's not, it's not an optional. It's not a nice to have. It's the only way out. And I think if we work together on that, we can, we can get that message and we can get new people on board because they're, because they're ready for it and they're starting to appreciate it. Amazing, man. Amazing. Any, any thoughts on JD Vance and uh, Peter Thiel and Palantir and where, where they, you know, how they could affect the dynamics here if, if Trump were to win? I don't know if you're well, familiar with. Well, well, the, so, the, so the interesting thing, I wrote an article about this four or five months ago saying Trump was going to lose kind of no matter what. And, and the reasoning behind it is that these elections, the candidates don't matter and the policies don't matter. The elections now at the national level are their propaganda campaigns run by big data and AI. The Republican Party and the Democrat Party, they have massive databases. The Democrats have a huge advantage going all the way back to 2008 because they invested in it. So they have 500 data points on every voter. So they know that they're just going to send out the week before the election. They're going to do a big get out the vote campaign. You know, they're going to go into nursing homes and be like, if you don't vote for whoever the candidate is, you're going to be out on the streets. And you can see it already. They're, you know, lowering prescription drug prices. All this stuff has no basis in economic reality. But just the fact to win votes. But it's to win votes. But but the yeah. scary facts are this. It gets worse every time I give this because I get updated stats. 74% of Americans can't identify the three branches of government. 53% of Americans don't even know what the electoral, electoral college is. Only 40% could identify who the vice president is. So people can be online like, this guy had a great policy debate. Trump, Elon Musk, right? The, the Trump, Elon Musk thing I thought was, was whatever. The content was a joke, but I'm kind of like, guys, uh, FDR had fireside chats with 60 to 80 million people when we only had a population of 126 million people. So the fact that he had a million people on a stream, like it, it, if they're going to be 160 million people that vote, who cares? Like this is a this this isn't moving the needle. It's these get out the vote that are going after the the no to low information voters that drive the vote total. Mm -hmm. The I think one of the reasons Trump won in 2016 is because he had Peter Thiel and he had Palantir on his side and he didn't in 2020. So that Palantir's help actually bridged the gap between mm. the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. So the really interesting thing is what's going to happen with this election. Is Palantir going to help? Because if, 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 because if he doesn't close that gap, he'll lose no matter what. And it'll be a dramatic loss because the Republican Party has actually gotten worse. We were supposed to have a red wave in 2022. Even after all of the controversy and everything in 2020, there was no red wave. That is a function of the database, the AI, and the get out the vote apparatus that the Republicans have that is a disadvantage. I, as to the J.D. Vance thing, I, I look at it as is, all of these things are manufactured polarity. Right. They're building a to, towards a one world government technocracy where scientists and engineers make all of the decisions for us. And there's a social credit system that they're working on that. And the way they do that is one manufactured polarity at a time. They get us divided into these 50 50 battles that never get resolved. Right. It's going to be about bathrooms one day. It's going to be about this. And you'll know, we never resolve them. Right. We just go from one dopamine hit to another one divided thing. And then we move on and we forget about it. It's like people have almost forgotten about the fact that there was an assassination attempt a few weeks ago. That's like moved out of the news cycle. That's like, hey, give me more. What's the new what's the new thing? But the ultimate battle here to me is the, the the big polarity contest and the big contest is technocracy versus technocracy you have this is where i actually answer the question you, have, you posed which is that you have the paypal mafia which is which is teal and musk and jd vance and they happen to be this time around pushing on the republican side they're using the republican side as their vehicle to push mm -hmm. their technology 
bureaucracy to get their systems into implemented, to get their cronyism in place, right? Teal's already implanted with Palantir. Uh, even when you listen to the space with, with Musk and Trump, well, well, what is Musk basically asking for? He's asking, well, we should do these moonshot projects. We should do, which happen to be all, you know, his projects, right? He's lining this up to push technocracy from the right. And then you have Microsoft and OpenAI and the others pushing from the from the left, but in the end, we're going to get technocracy one way or the other. So you're just picking which technocratic overlord are you going to get? Are you going to get the PayPal mafia? You're going to get Microsoft and OpenAI. That's all the the meta thing is about. Which, by the way, the answer to all of that is the same: opt out and use privacy coins because we don't want to be a part of the X payments WeChat clone that he's building ultimately. I mean, this is a, the, a, the only game in town right now, but but X is going to turn into, it, it, he, Musk said he wanted it to be WeChat. Well, WeChat is like the basis of the social credit system in China. So once they layer payments on here and we've got all of the identification for payouts and everything else, like this, this is the this dystopian platform. So, um, I, so I think that Teal is, is pushing the technocratic agenda through JD Vance and that the teal is actually driving a lot of the ship here. Um, where do you, where do you think he ends up standing on privacy coins and things like Monero? I mean, do they, you know, straight up try to try to ban those things. I mean, it, it goes against their ideology, right at the, at the same, you know, the, he, he's a libertarian that runs a, a, a company that offers surveillance to, to the U S government. Um, you know, he has this, this face of being the ultimate libertarian, but he's providing, you know, surveillance technology to, to the government. Where does he come down on, on privacy tools, privacy uh, cryptos? I used to think he was a libertarian. I do not think he's a libertarian. I don't think in any way you could define him as a libertarian mm. now. And I used to think that because he used to say he was a libertarian before he even yeah. got involved in politics. But I don't know how backing a company that is using surveillance technology to try to, to, to predict pre-crimes, right? Like, <laughs> this is the, I'm sorry, that's about as far off as you can get. So, and by the way, there's some other disturbing personality traits about him. Like, for instance, the fact that he bankrolled privately Hulk Hogan's lawsuit to get Gawker shut down because he was he was pissed off that he had been exposed for, you know, for being gay. And so he, he did this, demonstrated a willingness and ability to be completely passive aggressive in a profound way. So mm. he has, he's very Machiavellian and and he seems willing to to skirt way outside of any set of libertarian principles that you and I know. And I caught glimmers of his uh, Joe Rogan thing yesterday. And he said and he said, well, crypto, if crypto was libertarian, uh, AI is is communist in structure. But but he didn't necessarily say, well, crypto is libertarian and therefore I like crypto. So I didn't mm. hear him make a comment on that. But here's what worries me. What Trump said was, in the first 100 days, he's going to pass crypto legislation to provide clear rules of the road. Well, so who's who's the Loomis is the one that is is the most advanced, obviously, in developing what these proposals are. So I don't see any reason to believe that I, wh who's the pro privacy person. I do not know of a pro privacy person that is is actually uh, advising Trump. Now, I talked to Vivek, and Vivek has read my book, and, and, and actually I helped push Vivek to push Trump on the CBDC issue, but I don't think Vivek is a privacy coin guy either. In fact, mm -hmm. it, Vivek read my book and he said he liked the first half. He didn't like the second half. Well, the second oh. half was exit was was use alternative assets. You know, his plan was he. Oh well, we're gonna we're gonna save the dollar and we're gonna have sound money. I mean, that was his position, and we didn't. We got into it a little bit and and ran out of time. But but he, he Vivek is not a privacy coin guy. So mm -hmm. then so then who is advising him? Okay, well let's now now who are we talking about? The Winklevoss twins. And I've been trolling the Winklevoss twins hard because if if you followed any of this, what they did to to Charlie Shrem, I mean, they were like hostile. They were they were they were happy about the fact that Charlie Shrem was you know doing jail time. I mean, they were not. They were working with Ben Losky in New York to get a bit license. Mm -hmm. And then you follow their their pat. People should look at this. So there's this fair shake pack that has like $200 million, right? So you'll see people online like, oh, yeah, $200 million pro crypto pack. This is great. Finally, we're going to have a voice at the table. I think the Winklevoss twins put in $40 million 
Uh, it's Andreessen Horowitz. It's all a bunch of VCs, all a bunch of Silicon Valley guys. What was the first race that they put money into and won? It was to get Adam Schiff to win the U.S. Senate primary in California. So their first contribution to crypto is Adam Schiff. So if you are a, a privacy person or a liberty person, I can tell you right now, Adam Schiff is not somebody that you 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 would support. So they obviously have attention. Now, at the same time, and by the way, this is something I don't know the answer to, but I just saw that the Winklevoss twins invested in some Zcash related project. Mm, okay. And, and I haven't followed all the D. I need to dig into that to understand what that is. I get so on the one hand, you could say, hey. Um, they just invested in Zcash, and if they have Trump's ear, then maybe maybe the policy will end up being pro privacy coin. But then I look at it and I say, I look at the Winklevoss twins' history with all this stuff, and they certainly don't seem to be ideologically aligned with liberty. So maybe they're going to taint Zcash. So I I actually want to, I, I, if anybody knows, I'm going to investigate that more. That's on my list of things to to research. But I guess at the end of the day, I don't know of anybody that's advising Trump that's pro-privacy and Cynthia Loomis is anti-privacy explicitly. <clears throat> yeah. And the closest thing we got to pro-privacy are people that are backing Zcash and ignoring Monero for, for whatever reason. Right. Yeah. Um, Aaron, man, thank you so much. So, so much information. Uh, I, I love the way you just have your your ear to the ground and all this, and you're very good at conveying all this information and and seeing where the uh, the cronyism and hypocrisy is. Oh, no, um, I appreciate it. it's great. It's always great to come on, and I, I'm really looking forward to uh, Mexico City. I, I I'm I'm very excited about this event. It's going to be great. I'm going to meet pe uh, people that I've been talking to. I've never met the Zeno guys in person, right? So it's yeah, gonna you're going to have you're going to have good quality time down there, FaceTime with them and a bunch of other, you know, liberty loving, intelligent people. Yeah, I have to say we att we attract a good crowd. Um, a lot of that is that you know the the Monero devs, and you know it's 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 a very it's a very good crowd that uh, uh, is is principled, right, and sticks to the principles. So it's 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 nice. You're going to appreciate it. Thank you so much, man. Stick stick around if you can. Um, yep. I would like to, to move on because we're about two hours in already, which is which which is good. That, no complaints. That's the shut off. Uh, I know for Streamyard too. So. <laughs> no, no, no. We'll, we're going to keep going. We'll, we oh, usually okay. go like four hours. So uh, oh, okay. yeah, stick 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 around if you can. We're going to bring up uh, Tux. Should we bring up the viewers on stage? If anybody wants to like quickly do a Q and A with Aaron, maybe they got some questions before we move <laughs> on to the news. Aaron, would that be cool? Do you want to uh, answer oh, yeah. some questions? If sure, absolutely. Up? Always. Tuxie there? I don't yep. know if he... Uh... Yeah, maybe we'll do that just so Aaron uh, can stick around a little bit and answer questions before we move on to the news. All right, that'll be good. I'll run All the right, viewers cool. on stage. Awesome. It's the viewers on stage segment. It's that time where we invite you, the viewers, up on stage to comment on anything you've heard so far today, ask the guest a question, or maybe talk about one of the news topics. Come on down. All right, guys, posting the StreamYard link into the chat. Um, if you're in the backstage, let me know if you want to come up. Yeah, jump up, ask Aaron a question. We got 300 and live viewers on X, 34 on YouTube. This is good. Like I've, had share. A, I've had a question for Aaron for years now, which oh. is um, <laughs> I, I, so I, oh, maybe about a year. But I, I totally, I think pretty much everybody who watches this show, we all agree that there's no political solution, at least in a federal sense. Um, <clears throat> And I'm 100% all in with you that there is no hope for like a federal political solution at all. I think the only chance we had in my living memory was probably the Ron Paul revolution. And we all saw what happened with that. But I was wondering how you felt about like local or even uh, state movements like the Free State Project. I know you've chimed in a lot about that. Um, my position was I thought that it actually went too big too fast. Like a, the free counties project would have been a better starting point, in my opinion. But I was wondering, um, what's your position on things that can be done as far as politically at a very microcosmic and local level? Because it's my take that 
that that there's a lot of juice to be squeezed in that place. What do you think? So I spent a lot of time on that. In fact, that's where I actually spent most of my time was was actually at the local level in New Hampshire. So I was actually the chair of the Free State Project for a while. I've been here for almost 16 years and um, run a number of organizations. Uh, my wife did as well. She ran a group called the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, which is which is the dominant uh, liberty group in in New Hampshire. So she got probably 200 people elected while she was was chair. And um, what I'll say is, so I got involved in, in this at the state level. And, and, and in part, I wanted to stop Obamacare, Medicaid expansion. And it turns out the Republicans were the ones that ended up passing it. So if I go back and look at where we were 10 years ago versus where we are today, I, and, and, and as much as I say this, I love New Hampshire. New Hampshire is the best state and you should and you should move here. But you should move here because there are merchants that you can trade with using crypto and gold backs because there's a community of like minded people that you can inter interact with outside of the system. But even with Republican majorities at the state level, the the size, the percentage of the uh, federal budget. Uh, this, the, the percentage of the New Hampshire budget that comes from the federal government has surged. The control of the federal government has surged. Even though we're relatively better than other states, the federal government has still creeped up in terms of its impact. And this is why I got to where I am on focusing on CBDCs, which is if we don't stop CBDCs, CBDCs are going to are going to trump whatever's going on at the local level because you're going to have centralized programmable control over your money, which is control over your behavior regardless of where you're located. Can I ask you a question though about that creep real quick, just to dive a little deeper? Yeah. So do you think that the the uh okay so yes there is creep and there's creep at every state but do you think new hampshire was effective at slowing that creep with the free state project and other like sub projects and then the other question is do you think it has kind of that art of war effect of because the feds have to work so much harder and put so much more resources into it that it almost it's almost like defending a fortification versus like being wide open for invasion sort of thing i've 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 wanted to ask you about just that whole concept in general for quite some time now so so my my view on it is that, and this is just where i came out on and then i've, I've waffled back and forth because i was going to get back into it on on a local basis because i'm actually working with citizens for sound money which which promotes Gold and silver is legal tender at the state level. So on the one hand, I, what I'm saying is, is a, it's a little bit hypocritical because I actually keep on going back and forth myself. So I, so I'm, I'm like, I know the federal government's not it, but I actually, I feel like we need to. Uh, it's kind of like if you put your attention on hedging on something that you don't want, and everybody's putting 30% of their attention on something that they don't want, you're going to end up getting that. So I'm a big believer in putting 100% of my attention in, into the thing that I want and trying to kind of move it that way. Has it helped? It, it's help. It only has helped. It's the I said this analogy about the presidential election where I said, I think it's better if Harris wins the presidency, but the Republicans win the Senate because it will finally demoralize people enough that they'll realize that they should they should have never banked on trump to fix it because no president could actually fix the structure of the thing anyway but finally they'll be demoralized enough to start putting their attention on alternative solutions and it's the same at the state level so at what point do you go from what i call slow fail right so you're so the political strategy is just to fail at a slower rate failing at a slower rate is only good if you're using the time to develop an alternative solution but if you're if you're failing slowly but then you're buying into the fact that the slow fail itself is the strategy moving forward, then you'd be better off collapsing faster so that you can rip the bandaid off. So that's, that's kind of my answer. So I, you know, I, I guess it's good that we have it here if it's slowing things down, but provi provided that people understand that it is just slowing things down to something else. Now I, I actually believe in secession. So, so ultimately I think that if we could actually get to secession out of this, then that is actually the way to go. And if you secede, then what you should be talking about in parallel is, okay, well, what would a New Hampshire, uh, look like from first principles if it seceded. And I think that first principle conversation needs to be happening in, in general. And I've actually tried to get that conversation going and it's not something people have been interested in, but it's been 250 years since this country was founded. It was founded on a set of foundational principles that were then turned into like, 
there were debates, the Federalist Papers, all this stuff going on back and forth. And then that was codified in, in, into the Constitution in the same way that the white paper outlines the principles. And then the code itself is, is essentially kind of the Constitution, if you want to make a parallel structure. And I would say, have, have we learned anything about the nature of man and the nature of government in 250 years that might cause us to, to from first principles, redesign how it works? So I, I have one more question on the same topic. It's, I've been waiting a long time. to. <laughs> okay, so I think your opinion is falling in, in line a lot with other people from this community, from what I've gathered, that like pretty much any political solution is kind of a waste of time. But there's, there is one thing that I think is very interesting, which is, um are you aware of how uh maine had passed for example the amendment to the right to put what you want in your body i forget what they call it but there's like an actual constitutional amendment about like growing your own food and eating what you want and taking whatever medicines you want or whatever um i wonder if <clears throat> at least the pretext of something like an amendment protecting something is a strong enough bulwark to me. And, and then the other thing is, is it would take less, like let's say political energy to get it in place and then leave it there as opposed to constantly making the fight. So would you comment on that idea of like, is that maybe one thing that is worthy of pursuit or not? It depends on, it, it all depends on how the bills are drafted. And I guess part of my so having elected all these candidates and knowing all these people for a long time, I've, I've never seen a situation where, where, where people have actually retained their principles after getting elected. And, and that has happened in a, it, like it, it, I've just have empirical evidence for over a decade doing that. So the issue that I, I have think is, that is, well, I, I can tell you what, what, what often happens, what, what happens is, and it's almost a common process. You, you'll actually hear it's like, well, in order to get into power, to order to elevate, into a leadership role, you have to compromise. And then what you start telling yourself is, well, once I get into control, once I get into power, then I'll change things. But what happens is you get corrupted by the process. And so you make all these alliances with people basically to try to get into power. But then by the time you get there, you don't actually, your power is based on those, those compromises. And so there's a tendency to not then break those Comp that break what got you into that position. And then you hear the same language about the rationalization of it, which is, well, this is just how the game is played, right? That people be like, well, this is just, this is the adult way to do it. This is just, you know, uh, th this is, this is the way the game is played. And, and I, I know how the game is played and I, I could talk about some of my activism, but, but you know, I, I, uh, primaried nine state senators and then I ran for state or for the United States Senate and cost Kelly Ayotte her seat intentionally because, she was messing with state politics to get reelected. And so I'm like, okay, if you're going to screw with the state, then for your personal federal race, then I'll run as an independent to cost you the race. And, and it did. It was the most expensive per capita U.S. Senate race. So you can play the game differently. But if you, if you get into this mindset of, oh, I'm going to play the game as the game is played, then you end up kind of selling out. And so that, that has happened over and over again. And so I've seen that so much or that, and another common thing is you'll work on these small bills, but then the big multi-billion dollar bills that are the federal government encroaching on the state, people don't even try to challenge those things. And so what's actually going on is the state is losing its solvency. It's losing its sovereignty. And you're focusing on these little pyrrhic victories, these little small wins that in the grand scheme of things, you end up with net tyranny but you get a few things that are your pet projects along the way. And that I, this is just what I've seen happen. And um, it's like, we, we've got a, a state rep that's been pro crypto, but he just came out with an article talking about the Bitcoin strategic, re, re, supporting the Bitcoin strategic reserve. And then, you know, wanting to push the state to do this. And this is a free stater that was supposed to be the crypto Liberty guy. I, in fact, I will tell you, I was thinking about getting back in politics, specifically in New Hampshire to work on legislation around privacy coins, around anti-CBDC, around the, the, the great taking, making gold and silver legal tender. And then when I saw that, I'm like, all right, that's it. You know, we're, we're just, if, if, if we're going to go now, Bitcoin strategic reserve, we're going to go this complete crony way. And these people are supposed to be the top Liberty people, then, then it's over. 
and it's a waste of time. So I'm actually not getting back in. This is why I say when I waffle on this, I'm waffling on this because I was actually considering getting back in. And then just within the last two weeks, I've seen what the people that are supposed to be at the forefront of liberty are doing. And it's, it's a lost cause. <clears throat> so, I, you know, again, I, it, I guess there is a way where it could be effective, but I, I've not seen it yet. And there's also all, a, a tendency for people to focus on the state house instead of the state senate. And, and it turns out it's just like with Congress, the big decisions end up being made by the Senate. So you have a whole bunch of people yapping and running around like, you know, like the Boberts of the world and people getting a lot of media attention and making a lot of noise. But at the end of the day, the bad legislation is what wins. And I, I have seen that paralleled at the state level. Now at the local level, I, I went to the Red Pill Expo, which was great. And I got to meet G, G. Edward Griffin and he has a thing that he's doing called Red Pill University. And, and the whole idea behind this is to do a local approach and to build a network of people that are committed to a set of found, foundational principles at the local level. I mean, and I'm not opposed to that idea, but I will say I, of all of the political activism I've done, the most vile um, and intense thing I've ever done is run for school board. I mean, and I ran for president of the United States and the worst, like, I, I'm not even kidding. I had... 2% of, I lived in a town of 20,000 people. We had 278 people in a Facebook group that were dedicated to making sure that I lost, committing election fraud. Somebody actually printed out the stuff that was in the group. I, I had like all kinds of stuff happen. And what you learn at the local level is in particular, <clears throat> in a lot of places in, in small towns, the largest employer is the school system itself. So the ability to make change when you're going up against a teacher's union is tough because they have millions of dollars and uh, and they're trying to protect something. So the ability to get citizens to come in and actually change a school board where you win enough seats and sustain enough seats over time to actually change the school board, that is really difficult because it's really expensive. And the question is for the individual involved, what's the, what's the payoff, right? So... Uh, and so it's amazing how much these school board, the uh, teachers unions actually end up dominating the uh, the vote, the get out the vote effort for these local elections. And then that also then affects town council and, and the other seats. So you end up having a very I mean, it's brutal. Like I like it is a truly brutal thing. I'm not saying it's not worth doing, but I'm saying it's if you're going to do it, understand it's so much harder then you think it's even harder than state level politics because of what's the economic interests that are actually entrenched at the state level and the machine that they have that makes it difficult because nobody's built a get out the vote. There's no pro-liberty get out the vote apparatus for the town council. There's no pro-liberty get out the vote apparatus for school board. Right? Those get out have, of voting. <laughs> That's <huh>? our motto. <laughs> get out of voting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I've seen it, I've seen it here even in New Hampshire where people are like, well, we lost this. Because only, you know, 80 people came out and voted. Like there were a bunch of people that made a bunch of noise, did a bunch of signs, and yeah, people just don't go out and vote. It's March. Yeah, there's low, low turnout. So I'm not saying it's impossible, I, but I, I'm just saying that the voters are generally pretty uh, unengaged and, and low information. And so it's a really hard barrier. But this is why I ended up where I was, because if, if we don't stop the CBDC thing, I don't think any of this matters um at all so that's why i've actually laser focused on this but even if we stop cbdc's this isn't a solution this is just preventing global technocracy we do need to have a much bigger chat about what we're actually going to do and this is one of the problems that we have i i you know so if you're liberty minded then anything is possible right what what eight billion people can do through voluntary interaction is infinite in terms of possibility and so it's hard for people to think abstractly because our public school indoctrination centers don't want us to think abstractly. They try to teach us how to think concretely and they try to actually program what it is that we think. So it's hard to sell the message of liberty because it requires people think abstractly and think about the unknown. Whereas the technocrats push out 15 minute cities, they have glossy brochures, right? Here's what the, here's the one utopian vision we have. But when you're a liberty person, you can't have a utopian position because by nature, liberty is an individual thing where how can you predict the infinite? How can you predict the combinations of decisions people are going to make if they have freedom? But it's harder to sell abstract than it is concrete. I, unless somebody else has a question, I could, but I, I'm sure somebody else has a question. But yeah, I, let's, you know, let's, uh, 
let's see if anybody else wants to wants to jump in and then we'll move on with the news uh we get a couple more I, questions yeah, i have a get question. other people up here go ahead shortwave so um just real quickly can i get your books anywhere except amazon or in print because i'm uh legally blind and so i can't not read regular print print books and the only like audio books or accessible ways i can see of getting your books is on amazon and i don't have one of those Um, I can probably send, send you files. I can probably just send you the files that we, we used for Amazon. I, I've got to think of how I, I keep trying to remember how that worked. I had to do it chapter by chapter, but, um, you just reach, reach out to me, uh, after this and, and let me see if I can get you the, the, the files that I'd uploaded to Amazon. Sure. Uh, if I can figure out how to do that, but yeah, cause as I said, I don't have Twitter or anything like that. Um, okay. How, how could I get a hold of you? Um, put it in the private chat. Yeah, um, I'll I'll put my email address in the private chat. How's that? Perfect. I had a question about um, like the election, Trump, and and all that. So my thinking right now actually is is maybe a little bit different than yours. I, I think that the it's more likely that the assassination was was kind of a faked WWF thing. Um, where real people died. Anyways, I, I figure they wouldn't do that unless they really wanted to elect Trump um, and then have him sort of like oversee the next big crisis. But on the counterpoint of that, like if Kamala wins, it, it's hard for me to believe that that the nation would actually elect this chick. Um, and I wonder about the potential for civil war or like a man, like a stage, not a fake civil war, but like a managed civil war where Trump like, you know, leads uh, Trump is supposed to be the leader of the opposition forces or something like that. Like, do you, do you see any potential for that or, or what's your thoughts on that? I mean, you know, the whole, uh, after watching people comply with COVID tyranny, I, you know, I, I guess I keep on asking myself, would, 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 will people stand up for anything? Like, like really, what is the, the, the barrier? I mean, if she wins, are people really going to, to protest? And so I think it's a, there may be, there may be a manufactured civil war. And again, the, but the whole point of this is to move towards global government and a global technocracy. I mean, this is actually going on. What's interesting is, 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 you know, you look at the COVID situation and you'd think, oh, well, based on what we know, we probably shouldn't have pushed these vaccines. I mean, there's no, no way looking back on it, you can, you can say that that was honestly a good idea. Yet the World Health Organization is developing pandemic alliances that will erode national sovereignty and will actually put us in a position where they could declare uh, a climate crisis as a health emergency through the WHO pandemic alliance and use that to actually further erode uh, so, uh, sovereignty and push us more towards one government. So I think either way, whether it's Trump or whether it's Harris, it's going to be 50-50 divided. But, you know, does it turn into a civil war or does it just turn into one more manufactured thing where we lose that much more in terms of surveillance and privacy and more rights, which has been going on for decades and really ramped up after 9/11. <clears throat> I just want to I just want to thank who we got here prying lantis tip $5. Great talk guys. We will continue to fight for freedom. Thank you so much man. Yeah, all tips that are sent through to xmrchat.com/monerotalk will go towards uh basically improving xmrchat.com. So greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Do we want to do the news or should I throw out another question? Maybe I could I could ask. No, let's, uh, let's let's move on to the news. Otherwise, we'll we'll this will be one of those uh, super long days. If Aaron wants to stick around, he, he can. Uh, but yeah, I don't want to take up too much more. Of his well, time. I, I I did see somebody ask something about. Zeno, but I, I can't even see that question now. It was a long yeah, time. sure. Let me bring that up. Hold up. I did see that. Hi, Aaron. Quick question on Zeno. I support your view on the relevance of privacy tokens. Do you believe this will reflect on the cost of the token and project? This isn't Bitcoin. You're in the wrong place. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I hope it spurs use. I hope it spurs people downloading wallets and, and trying using it. Do I, do I think it will, will increase price? I mean, I think about, I think Zeno has such a low market cap. I honestly, you know, I'm trying to buy more. So it's one of those, it's kind of a bad case scenario where it's, uh, 
Um, I just wrote this brownstone article and, you know, I reference Monero and I reference Zeno and it's like, you know, when this stuff gets out, you know, more people look into it. I mean, it's bound to, to help the price at, at some level, but the purpose is to, you know, I hope what happens instead is people actually start using it. And when they start using it, then the price increases. So I hope this ends up being a utility driven price increase as opposed to a hype based pump and dump type of thing. So I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't really engage in that or, or making any predictions about price or even focusing, focusing on that. I'm more focused on getting the word out and getting people using these things. Very good. Very good. And Mondetta tip 25 cents. Check this out. More local exchange accepting Monero without KYC. And then he references XMRbizarre.com listings. I don't know what those links are. I got to check that out. Um, so maybe it's business listings on XMR Bazaar for Monero accepting local exchanges. Very cool. All right, guys. Um, I guess we're going to go ahead and move into the news. Uh, thank you so much, Aaron Day, for coming on and talking with us and taking some questions. Uh, feel free to stick around if you'd like, if you have time. Sure. Um, once again, thanks for coming on. No, thank you for having me. I, I enjoy it. This is I, I, I love that this is this is my crowd. I've been I've been searching for a while. <laughs> Thank you, man. Greatly appreciate it. Very excited to hang out with you in person at Monerotopia in November. Uh, please continue to spread the word to your tribe because I know I know you have a you have a large audience. So uh, we appreciate you getting the word out on everything. Thank you, man. We'll, we'll do.